Okay, this is the pre-class video for class number 14 in RPH 140 World Philosophies. We are going to start out with your comments about the newspaper articles related to China and China's leaders. They were, they're attached to the uh, Thursday's assignment. The students um, hadn't read it. So please, I told them to read it and we will cover it first thing today. I want you to be able to understand newspaper articles. So the news talks about the leader in China and what he's done recently and how he governs. And you know, one day of studying Confucianism can help you figure out what's going on in the news. Um, we are going to have a big, a big uh, competition between us and China during your lifetime. China is on the rise. Um, China will take a bigger and bigger share of the consumer market. So we need to figure out how to create products that the Chinese will buy. And the biggest one would be green technology. Um, Bill Gates talks about this in his book. He thinks that that's going to be the big money maker. Um, rich countries are best suited to develop innovative climate solutions. They're the ones with government funding research universities, national labs, and startup companies that draw talent from all over the world. Whoever makes big energy breakthroughs and shows they can work on a global scale and be affordable will find many willing customers in emerging economies. So um, I don't think that, you know, he's not going to create <laughs> Uh, animosity with China, but everybody knows that they are going to be a major, I think, our major competitor in the green energy market. Um, so anyway, you do need to know how China is governed. And the fact that we, America versus China, <laughs> We give people, I would say, too much freedom, freedom not to get a vaccine, freedom not to wear a mask, whatever. And China is too much control, I think, right? I'm a philosophy professor and there's a lot of censorship in China. I have one friend and he is on LinkedIn because that's the only place he can go uh, that isn't censored. And of course, there's plenty of stuff you wouldn't ever put on a LinkedIn um, uh, site, right? So basically, he doesn't have a free mind. And of course, to somebody like me, that means a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, those are things for you to think about. Too much government control, too little government control. Um, too much regulation, too little regulation, all this sort of stuff. All right, so now we do Hinduism. And um, start out with the cultural selection. So each culture sort of selects for where they really want to specialize. And uh, the West has focused on our relation to the natural world, but in particular in the enlightenment, exploitation of the natural world for human well-being to create economic wealth and growth. That has been our forte. <clears throat> and uh, China specialized in interpersonal relationships. And India specializes in the inner world. Um, they have like a hundred and some words for the self. <laughs> and Americans know me, myself, and I, that's about it. Um, all right. So the quote is, if I were to ask myself from what literature 
we who've been nurtured almost exclusively on the thought of the Greeks and Romans and of one Semitic race, the Jewish, um, may draw the corrective which is most wanted in order to make our inner life more perfect, more comprehensive and more universal. In fact, a more truly human life, I should point to India and he means Hinduism. Um, it's interesting, I have students from India and I have students from Nepal who are Hindu and they understand how capitalism, especially capitalism advertising, all these things have influenced the way they think in a lot of ways have colonized their minds. Uh, but even if there weren't one Hindu living, Hinduism is worth studying because it's about human nature. And it was, it developed over many thousands of years. It's like the oldest religion. And I do think it's very amazing. I mean, I like them all. Houston Smith likes them all. That's why I like reading his book. He's very fair. <laughs> Sometimes to the point where, okay, okay, but what actually goes on? Um, but Hinduism is so comprehensive because it's old. The chakras, the Hindu chakras, they really worked out an incredible system of, of inner body chemistry, and outer, you know, a way of life, but it's a very obviously inner directed way of life. So, you know, Americans, like you are your CV, you are what you do, you are your accomplishments, you know, you aren't important unless you're busy. <laughs> like, wait a sec, that's exactly the opposite of Hinduism. Um, like if one of you, came back to class on Monday, back in the days, I guess we're gonna start having class. And you said, I had a great weekend. I stared into space all weekend. Uh, people would think you're probably weird. <laughs> and there weren't too many people for whom sheltering in place was the best thing that ever happened to them uh, because it's not the way Americans operate. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me because of my personality type. I, COVID was really good for me, <laughs> but I know that that's not true of very many people. So it's worth studying, however, because it strengthens your inner life. Now, lots, a uh, number of you commented on Confucianism. Confucius said, every day I examine myself. And then Socrates, know thyself. So self-knowledge, looking inward, is valued in all these traditions, but it's particularly focused on in Hinduism. Um, so the main issues that I want to talk about in the chapter is the notion of to convert simply means to turn around. And so you can have a philosophical conversion. You can have all of these ancient tra traditions involve some kind of turning around. Um, and we will compare Western science and psychology to Eastern mysticism to show that a lot of uh, studies, scientific studies show that those Eastern mystics sort of knew what they were doing. Um, the nature of stress, that it's cultural, the different paths in life. What do you want in life? The difference between chronological age and psychological age. And then once people decide they want the path to God, there's four different paths the stages of life and the stations of life. So these, this is interesting to me because 
it's very comprehensive. And like Confucianism, unlike the West, Confucius talked about different phases of his life. They were substantially different. And um, that Hinduism has that. Um, and Hinduism also has people think about God differently, and that's important. And then people are not all equal, and that's important, even though it gets perverted a lot. <laughs> So in Confucianism, people are not equal, right? Relationships are relationships of inequality, but they're based on the role, the social role you're playing. In uh, Hinduism, it should be like your natural capabilities and then your orientation. So we'll look at that for a minute. But the big hit thing about Hinduism is that it asks the question, what do you want, right? What do you want in life? And I ask myself that a lot. <laughs> and you should ask yourself that. It's very important. Um, and you never stop asking because it will help you decide how to react in a certain situation, how to be proactive and start you know, heading your life in a certain direction, try out this, try, you have to know, you know, what do you want? Don't react, act. <laughs> All right. So the, the goal in, okay. So the um, Hindu view is that what people really want is infinite joy, infinite knowledge, and infinite being. Um, they don't always know they want it, or they don't always want it in the first life cycle. Uh, but I mean, if they have enough reincarnations, eventually that would be the goal. Um, getting in touch with the inner Brahman, the Atman Brahman. Everybody is has a piece of the universe inside of them. And the goal of religious life is to get in touch with that inner Brahman, that energy. And if they can stay in sync with that, then they will, right, overcome physical pleasures, fear, get those two basic drives. Remember, pleasure and fear. They'll have a sense of purpose. They'll get rid of their ego. They won't get frustrated. They'll see everything from God's point of view and they'll experience joy, right? Next thing, knowledge. Know thyself. They'll be able to release all this repressed stuff. You know, the stuff you repress, the stuff you deny. Some It comes out in your dreams sometimes. Um, but you can release all of that. Know thyself clean out your unconscious, get connected to the universe, and be able to, again, see with your mind everything from the point of view of the cosmos. So joy would be what's in your heart, knowledge, what's in your head, and then um, infinite being that you can expand your sense of self, right? family, community, global community, humankind, you know, since the beginning of self-conscious awareness. And, and then you see your life as part of a cycle. And that just gives you peace. You're not fighting all the time for your little spot in the world. You're, you've connected yourself to all of being. That's what people really want to be in touch with the Atman. Um, the four paths, okay? So there's four paths in life and then four paths to God. The path in life, the, the young souls seek pleasure. Um, and the second, slightly a few more incarnations, they seek worldly interests, success. 
that after another few more incarnations, duty, they really want to serve others, sense of social responsibility. And then the last one is what they really want is to be in touch with the Atman and nothing else really matters. Um, then there's two ways for people to stay in touch. The two basic differences are the path of reflection, where God is thought of as impersonal. God is just energy. And the path of emotion, where love, the heart leads. And on that path, God is thought of as a personal, as personal because you love a person, right? You don't love energy. <laughs> you are energy something. But both of those paths involve meditation and action. It's just that they're different paths to get to God. Um, right. What's the purpose of mythological language is to unite unconscious and conscious. People can live integrated lives. What they feel, those drives, those basic instinctual drives have been civilized. So in Aristotle, you know, you move from pleasure and fear to not too much, not too little, right? You can integrate them into culture. So people exercise appropriate courage, appropriate uh, pleasure. And on Confucius, again, it's very much a training in how to feel pleasure and fear, but that that gets channeled into all these relationships. And in Hinduism and Buddhism, it gets channeled by meditation. Um, all right, so Hesiod was the Greek Confucius Taoism. Okay, Hindu, okay. All right, so first question I think I'll ask you in class. Have any of you had a conversion experience? How would you interpret that experience? And um, the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, is the story of a conversion experience within the context of the Hindu tradition. Arjuna, um, before the experience, his soul was impure, immature, and it was a a kind of enlightenment, right? He was able to see reality for what it is. Um, it reminds me of the Beatitudes, which is in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the one I think of is blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Um, all right, so then... The next point I wanted to make was that Westerners study physical reality, right? When you study science, physical facts, data, blah, blah. So, and then you have um, the psychology that studies the brain, the different parts of the brain and how it works together and all that. Um, the neurological pathways, right? as the brain develops, okay, it becomes more complex and more unique. But Hinduism, Buddhism, ancient traditions try to, to wire that part close to the brain stem that is uh, very similar for everybody's brain because <laughs> it develops early, right away. So that's why you get a lot of these same virtues because they're all ways to channel that original energy related to our instincts. Um, the old mind. Okay, the, the uh, Christian church has a tradition of mysticism, the contemplative life. I live with Benedictine nuns. I've done it for nine different summers during, I don't know, four to six weeks. Um, so there are different paths to get to that Atman Brahman, um, but there are plenty of trained 
medical doctors who also engage in meditation techniques. They write books about how well the ancient mystical masters understood the brain and the need to relax in order to keep the body healthy. So they, they understood stuff that Westerners could really use. <laughs> what is stress, right? So I'll ask you, what is stress? Do you think it's a social problem? Do you think it's a serious social problem? And, and we, of course, we've already read a whole article about this, um, but what I want you to think about is, is it socially constructed? So to what extent does our society set you up for stress, right? And I think you can argue that our society does set you up because it keeps telling you that in order to succeed, you have to please all these people and have the checkbox. And you can't control if you please other people all the time, right? Or you don't have the natural ability to do something that, that the world would call successful. Anyway, you end up getting your identity connected to things you cannot control. That causes stress, <laughs> right? But we'll, we can go through these questions um, I would like you to be ready in class to talk about if you think stress is a socially constructed experience. I mean, obviously it has a physiological side to it, but does our society set up people for stress? And then you can realize that in ancient cultures, people lived with a lot more to worry about right? They had to worry about food, clothing, shelter, staying alive, disease, their teeth falling out. I mean, everything. And somehow they managed to cope with it. And that was a function of Hinduism and Buddhism, that those meditation techniques gave people the resilience, the ability to live peacefully in the midst of all these stressors, right? Whereas we are kind of the other way around, really. So have you ever asked yourself, what do you really want? Um, how does Lion Education fit with what you want, right? And so the Hindu position is you can have what you want. Go ahead, the path of pleasure. Um, if that's the path you're on, go for it, right? And this is where you get sex ed with Dr. Beck. They have, uh, there's a tradition called tantric sex. And it does educate you in how to maximize your sexual pleasure. And the way to do it is to go slow. <laughs> and they like, it takes a lot of self-control if you really want to experience the absolute most uh, sexual pleasure <laughs> and every time you sort of go at it. So they, you know, they just say, if you're on the path of pleasure, just do it well. Um, and again, people who really take pleasure in eating aren't the ones who overeat. <laughs> They eat slowly, they eat food with a lot of flavor, which means, you know, you don't eat fast. They appreciate it there. You know, all those things wouldn't lead to obesity. So, so that's the path of pleasure. Um, so I want to, we used to have a teacher at Lion. Actually, I shouldn't say that. It's just like, oh, it's never here. It's always somewhere else. But Okay, have you ever seen these middle-aged men that go and buy these little uh, red sports cars and some of them have like a condom in the front, you know, this black thing covering them. I'm like, really? I mean, it's so sort of obvious. They have in their midlife crisis, they want to feel, feel virile, virile, virile again, you know, they want to 
I mean, nowadays you can just take some whatever those pills, ED pills or something. But um, anyway, a Hindu would not judge them, you know, like a Christian, a fundamentalist Christian would judge them, although Jesus said, judge not that you not be judged. I think your average Christian actually does a lot of judging. So, um, okay, so the guy with sports car um, would be judged. <laughs> but Hindu, no, just a young soul, you know, just a young soul. Never got out of adolescence, arrested development. But that's okay, you know, they'll have another incarnation. No, just takes time. <laughs> So that would be their attitude. Um, the next one is the pleasure, the path of success. And the trouble with success is that it's competitive. It's precarious. Um, it's ultimately unsatisfying. But I mean, you understand this, that you have to compete with people and um, you can, you know, fall back due to circumstances outside of your control. But if you succeed, you're never rich enough. You're never powerful enough. You're, you know, you're always internally conflicted or you're never satisfied, right? And, and it's just ultimately unsatisfying. That's why you don't get satisfaction from it. Um, there's so many people. <laughs> who in midlife or later on in life on their deathbed, they really wish they had spent more time with people, friends and family, but it's too late now. Um, so that's a younger soul. They'll, they'll get it right in the next, perhaps the next reincarnation, maybe, you know, however long it takes. Um, then, the next, the older, slightly older souls, they renounce those things and move on. Um, so the drive, okay. So uh, renouncing that world is sort of affirming a more meaningful way of life. Evidence that the life force is at work. True religion begins with the quest for meaning and value beyond self-centeredness. So that's the turning around. Then there's two paths there, the path of duty, living for the sake of something greater than yourself. Um, so a lot of the people on the board at Lion, most of them were successful businessmen, um, lawyers, whatever, and they decided to give back, right? After they established themselves in their careers, they started giving back, and Lion is one of the ways that they give back. Um, all right, but in the Hindu view, it's at a certain point, even that isn't enough, because people might give back and try to help other people and find out, you know what, people don't want to be helped or this is just, it's not going anywhere. You never know. And that's true. I mean, people give to Lion and they don't know if their money is going to, if it actually helps or if the students really are learning liberal arts, they really don't know. And so eventually Hindu says, People will say, is that all there is, right? I don't have any, I have all the money in the world, but I can't seem to, you know, make the world a better place. Um, I, I don't even do it. I just give money away. Somebody else is trying, but there's always these setbacks. So this is a spiritual crisis when somebody just rejects everything. And try and wants to start over to get in touch with the infinite within. So we already have what we really want. It's right there inside of you, but you have to get in touch with it. So all of the exercises 
Um, all the things you see are all ways to get in touch with the inner Atman. And um, Zimmer says it's actually very practical. These techniques, yoga, the chakras, the diet, it's all really well geared. It's been empirically tested over many millennia, millennia, because it works. Um, okay, so the one path is the path of knowledge. This is my path. So, I mean, I like this. When I was eight years old, I told my sister, I don't think God is a person. I think God is energy. And I remember that. I just thought like that. I used to lie in bed awake at night. And there were a lot of crickets outside of our window in the summertime, not in the wintertime. Um, but I remember sitting, listening, and thinking about, I'm a preacher's kid, so yeah, you think about God. Um, and that kind of intense reflection and meditation. So Hindu culture respects that more than people who think about God as a person. Um, all right. Um, the path of love, God has a personality. So Christianity, the Hindus think of Christianity and Islam and Confucianism as branches of the path of love because uh, Jesus, Confucius, and Buddha are just um, manifestations. They're personifications of this energy. Um, and they sort of have to apologize for making God into a person because the Hindu view is that God actually is energy. <laughs> so the one on the path of knowledge has actually got it right. But it's okay to be on the path of love and it's okay to make God into a person as long as you know God is not a person. <laughs> you can. That's why you have so many different Hindu gods and goddesses. Don't fixate on any one of them. It's what's underneath them that really matters. Um, and then um, I, I do think they, they say, forgive three sins. You are, you are everywhere, but I worship you here. You are without form, but I worship you in these forms. You don't need praise, but I offer you prayers because I have to personify you. That's my path. Then there are many different incarnations. So the notion that Christ was God incarnate. There were many religions before Christianity that thought that. So sorry, it's nothing new. Um, the path of work is when people say, I don't want to hear if you believe in God. I don't want to meditate. If the way that you show me your faith is by doing. So these are the activists, right? These are the ones who can't think about God except through action. That's the way their psychophysical system works. Um, very different from someone who gets in touch with the Atman via meditation, right? And that's very different from someone via relationships. And then the, the yoga, right? Um, all right, so then there's four stages of life. Again, you have the student. You're supposed to just learn everything you can, look at the patterns, get the lessons. Then the householder, just is very similar to Confucius. Then there's retirement, where you withdraw, and then there's detachment. Now, the interesting thing there is um, would you think? If Dr. Beck, uh, when she gets older, she comes and knocks on your back door and she has her begging bowl because she has nothing. And now she's begging for rice. Would you think, ah, Dr. Beck is truly a holy person 
Like I was lucky. I got this holy person for my teacher because she is in that detachment phase and she has detached herself and she is in touch with the Brahman. She's an old soul. <laughs> so I don't think the average American would think it was really cool if their teachers came knocking with begging bowls when they got in their 70s or 80s, right? It's just such a different view of life and what it means to, to reach the highest levels of success or what's honorable or whatever. Very different ideas of what's honorable and what's honored. <laughs> Then Houston Smith talks about the different stations in life. Um, so yeah, St. Paul talked about that and I'll use the quote. We'll go to his quote in a minute. Some people really are ideas people. I'm an ideas person, right? I think about these ideas and how much impact they have. People like... I point out to students that your parents and the people around you had a worldview. <laughs> you just didn't know it, but it was governing the way they treated you and the way they raised you. And so I'm aware of the power of ideas. Again, that paper about women's rights, that the idea that women are not equally capable governs everything else. That's just an idea right? And it wasn't even evidence-based, except that it, like John Stuart Mill says, it appears to be true, but it's not. Um, anyway, so I'm a person that understands the power of ideas or the power of art. Somebody who's an artist or a, a seer, someone who invents theories or theologies or things like that. And those people need time. They don't need money so much, but they provide vision, right? The artists, the preachers, the teachers, the philosophers, they, we need them. Everybody else does need them. Um, the administrators, right? They, those are incredibly difficult jobs. My son runs a charter school and unbelievable how complicated, how much responsibility he has, He's looked up to if he makes one mistake. Oh my, people just complain. It's really, really a difficult job. So that he doesn't pay himself enough. He's the one in charge of the pay scale. So normally uh, the, the average head of a charter school, founder and director, would get paid a lot more than my son pays himself because um, he doesn't want bad blood, right, between him and, and the staff and the teachers. So he has a much more equal pay scale. But it makes sense that they would get paid more. It's just how much more. Then there's the producers. They, people who really like having a 40-hour week job, they don't want to have to bring work home. Um, and they don't get paid as much, but they, they don't have as much grief or stress. Of course, after COVID, <laughs> how many jobs are like that? I don't know. And then the laborers, there was always these untouchables. And um, Mr. Smith points out, okay, it wasn't slavery. Obviously, it was bad, but this is a very old tradition. <laughs> and that was a better way of handling the fact that there's a lot of poverty and a lot of awful jobs and how to, how to actually incorporate people into the society, uh, how to still have people doing those jobs. Um, so the soul's coming of age in the world, very different view of time. They don't focus on social reform. They don't focus on utopia. They just focus on people staying in touch with this inner Atma. Um, but they're also, Hinduism has also been very tolerant. 
Now, nowadays, all over the world, religion is getting used as a weapon. So there, there's animosity in India between the Muslims and the, and the Hindus. But um, in general, Hinduism, you know, all the major religions are just different paths to God. That, that would be an honest Hindu. Um, okay. Now, I will spend a little bit of time talking about the creation stories. The main point I want to make is what is creation, right? I mean, we have all these battles about uh, these people believe that God created the earth. These people don't. It turns out, you know, Christians and Muslims agree. They have the same creation story, and yet they're killing each other, and demonizing each other, and going to war against each other. And um, on the other hand, the Hindus just... Their idea of creation is just this emergence. And they it's very interesting because the Muslim and the Christian and the Jewish, there's a God that's a person that goes, whammo, I want the universe, right? Um, so this handout is all about different views of what creation is. And even within Christianity, people have different views. There's there are Aristotelian Christians, there are Newtonian Christians and their idea of God as the clockmaker that wound everything up. Um, so I'll maybe mention that, talk a little bit more about that. Then the most interesting creation story is on page nine. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll talk about that a little bit. But my main point for you to think about is they had a lot of creation stories because they don't care. Like, sure, you like that one, go for that one. But there's this one for the same reason they have a lot of God. It's just like God is energy. You can personify this way or that way, but God is not a person. So they have a lot of different creation stories because they don't want you to get fixated on one image of what happened. It's just the universe emerged. You can think of it this way or that way or that way, like it doesn't matter. And so um, they have this view of uh, Vishnu and Brahman and Brahman is coming out of the navel of Vishnu. And, you know, it's just like whatever floats your boat, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. It's all energy and it comes in different forms. And there are all these incarnations. And then the forms of life get more complex. And then there's humans, and some of them are young souls, and then they reincarnate. And there's just this, this cycle of life. And within it, uh, human beings, once you get you're that far along in a, in a cycle. You try to stay in touch with the Atman until you cannot get reborn. Like the goal is not to get reborn, to get released into the universe, into the, into the universal energy, right? It's not a personal kind of um, afterlife where you're standing before this personal God who's got this check sheet like Santa Claus or what you did right and wrong? No, um, not at all. It's just uh, that it is interesting because the very thing that Hindus want, which is release from coming back, from reincarnating, would be the thing your average Christian probably wants. <laughs> I want a, another chance at life or I want to live forever or whatever. Um, so the power of ideas and people have substantially different ideas about really important questions. But that was why our founding fathers said, you can think anything you like with religion, but don't bring it into politics. 
don't bring it into the town hall meeting. The town hall meeting is about getting the trains to run on time, getting the sewer system to work, getting the street lights on. You know, it's very mundane. Uh, but you can have all these exotic ideas over here. It's fine. It's a free country. Um, this is the story of a conversion experience, the Gita. And I do have page numbers. I did ask you to order it. So I hope, you know, you can find those page numbers. But the character traits of a good person. Oh, my gosh. Here we go again, right? Humbleness, truthfulness, harmlessness. These are all translations, of course, from the original Sanskrit. But the fact that this is how to translate them is, is kind of interesting. So again, you can compare it to Confucianism. Um, so uh, answering Titus's question, Arjuna himself didn't stand up to authorities. He, what he had to do, his crisis was that his cousins had done something very egregious. So his side of the family had to go to war against his cousins. And he does not want to kill his cousins. And so he drops his sword and says, I can't do this. And then Krishna, Hare Krishna, it's, it's the Atman takes on human form and starts talking to him. Now you could call this his alter ego or whatever you want to call it. But symbolically, he starts talking to himself, or Krishna arrives. And Krishna says, you know, you've got it wrong. You have to do this duty because you have to get rid of the bad karma your cousins cause. You have to release good karma. But just don't do it with anger or revenge. Keep yourself in touch with the Atman while you're killing her cousins, right? Because, you know, you're releasing the universe from bad karma. That's what you're doing. So um, don't, don't get pride about how many people you killed or pride in the risks you took. Or, you know, that's ego, your ego getting involved in war. Don't get your ego involved, right? Just keep it focused on the religious duty to release the bad karma. Um, oh, moderation, relation between culture and nature, um, these different character traits. Okay. So when we talk about um, Gandhi, we'll talk about his view of um, his nonviolent. See, the, the thing is, Martin Luther King got his inspiration from Gandhi. Gandhi got his inspiration from the Bhagavad Gita. And it's about, you know, Gandhi said, we got to get the British out of here. It's bad karma, right? We got to bring the universe back to where it should be, which is the, the people of India governing themselves. And so he engaged in this nonviolent resistance. He didn't want to create bad karma. He wanted to release this bad karma and bring about this change. So the, the Gita was a big inspiration for him. Um, so so uh, that's, again, one, one place where all the world's religions converge. Because Martin Luther King referred to it in terms of natural law, Augustine, Aquinas, Socrates. Aristotle's virtues, right? That was the tradition he referred to in the letter from the Birmingham jail, because that's the Western tradition. But I'm sure King, well, first of all, he definitely studied Gandhi, and no problem there, because Gandhi, Gandhi's movement was not, you know, was recent enough that that would have occurred to a lot of people. But then, um, 
so Martin Luther King would know about the Hindu tradition and about the Gita. He just wouldn't talk about it in his letter because, you know, the audience, wrong audience. Um, so Rudolf Otto is a scholar who is looking at patterns in all of the religions. And he said there's a non-rational element in religion. It's connected to, again, those deep emotions. Um, and, and focusing too much on Orthodox Christianity, theology is not really what religion is about. It's about an emotional experience, which puts you in a certain frame of mind. You feel fear, right? Dread, a uh, feeling of personal nothingness. So this is chapter nine of the Gita. Uh, Krishna, Arjuna has this, this vision of the Brahma, the whole universe. And he sees all the energy of the universe in his mind. So this is his experience of this great mystery, feels overpowered. Um, St. Paul was like that. Jesus had a, his experience when he got baptized by John and went out into the wilderness. Um, Buddha had his enlightenment under the bow tree. But it's not just them, right? A lot of people have what they would think of as an experience like that. But now after 9-11, we had all these preachers coming out. Um, and so they disagreed a lot <laughs> about what this was about. Um, so I quoted a few of them here. And it does help you compare and contrast between a personal experience of the presence of this overwhelming reality and then a political experience that gets tied to God and God's will, right? And that is so easily corrupted. Uh, but on the other hand, I think a religion that refuses to engage with social justice and infuses to participate in political life, political association, relating to people who are fellow citizens, that, you know, a religion that refuses to look at that level of uh, human well being is also corrupt. So to refuse to get engaged is corrupt, but to let your engagement get distorted into some partisan political um, divisions so that religion becomes a weapon against people, internally divided people. That, that's not it. <laughs> so um, here we go. A lot of different conversion experiences. We'll talk about Gandhi. We'll talk about Buddha. We've already talked. We'll talk some more about Jesus and Muhammad and um, I have some others listed there that I won't use in this class because this is the summer version. Um, okay, so this one is about um, what do you think of a good parent? Usually it's, you know, driving your kid to every artsy, sportsy, you name it kind of class or whatever so that they can find out who they are and each child is different and all this wonderful stuff and that's what we reward right and we have this myers briggs i don't know if any of you have taken it but um you know it's introvert extrovert sensing intuitive thinking or feeling and judging or perceiving so you have these different types and you have the 16 different boxes. Um, so it, I do want the students to talk about if they've ever taken these tests and what they think of them. So my main point is, first of all, the tests were originally set up by corporations so they could make more money. <laughs> ah, surprise, surprise. 
because you want people in jobs they enjoy and they're good at because then they'll work harder and actually be more successful, more productive. So we're going to give a personality test. The second thing I want you to notice, it tends to be, oh my gosh, I've taken those tests and I there's so many times when you have to answer A or B and neither A or B fits me at all. And I'm just thinking, what is this test going to, I mean, how could it turn out in any meaningful way? So that's part of it. It's a very blunt instrument. Um, second of all, I was taking it when I had little kids and I just thought, how do you want me to answer this? Before I had kids, after my kids leave, or while I'm having kids, because I just completely change. So that, you know, to respond to the needs of my children. So we change at different times in our lives too. And we should, like, we shouldn't put ourselves in this box and just stay there. The whole world will go, you know, you have to adapt. Anyway, and the third point is that there's no dark side, right? Nobody says, oh, you're in E, what would be E, S, F, P, maybe, you know, one of these. Oh, that's the snake oil salesman. Be careful. This kind of person will really, you know, be a dishonest salesman. <laughs> Watch out for this one. This is going to be that passive aggressive one that goes and, you know, stabs you in the back when you're not or watch out for this one. <laughs> no, there's nothing negative. Like everybody's beautiful in their own way. Oh, go, go. So <laughs> again, I think it's tied to money making, right? Um, so everybody's beautiful. Didn't you know that? And so um, you can go through this test if you want to. Um, people really are different. That's the only punchline. And then I have a quote from St. Paul about spiritual gifts, different gifts. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. I like this quote because I was different. You know, I had a different gift. I thought God was energy and a few other things. Um, so, you know, and my, my father is pretty nice about it. He didn't, he thought that was fine if I thought that. Um, so that idea that everybody has, people have recognized for a long, long time, the, the Hindus thousands of years ago, that people have different gifts, but it can all be uh, exercise in the same spirit leading up to the Atman, or in Paul's case, you know, related to Christianity. Um, and then the last thing with, is this article about the environment. And this is the outline about the article. And it should be pretty obvious that a Hindu would favor a sustainable society and they'd be against uh, environmental destruction because that's bad karma. <laughs> right so we'll talk about that a little bit and i do want you to, to just realize in your head that well yeah of course right um the effectiveness of hinduism and conservation so there are non-violent movements against i mean in favor of conservation in in india that are you know the chipko movement is one of them, and, and there's a number of them, and there probably will be a lot more too as time goes on. Um, and then the Buddhist attitude. So uh, I'll, we'll talk about that later when we talk about Buddhism. Um, but what I wanted to get to was, here's the article, right? It's on, begins at the end of page five, really starts at page six, one, two, three, four, five, six pages and seven, seven or eight pages. I do want you to read it over the weekend if you don't get to it um, by class time on Friday. 
all right, I think I have talked too much, but that's what we're going to do. And I will see you tomorrow, Friday. And it's two in the morning. Dr. Beck, what the heck? All right, we'll see you.